and only imagine, but we long for the same. Let's have a word of prayer before we go into God's word. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you again as your children by means of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who suffered and died, Lord, that we could be at peace with you, Father, that we can come to you, open your word, and seek your truth. And it's, Father, it's that truth we pray that you would seal into our hearts this morning, that we would know you as real, that your heaven is real, and that, that we are citizens of that kingdom that will be for eternity. We long for that day, Lord, uh, that um, by your will that we would all be together. And Father, we pray you bless our time this morning. Your Holy Spirit would be the interpreter that we would know your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you all for your understanding on Wednesday. I apologize. We, uh, we will still cover everything in the study. Um, just uh, took a little bit of time to get some things straight uh, health-wise and different things, and I appreciate y'all's grace in that, so thank you um, for it. Um, but this morning, I'm ready to go at it. Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to find ourselves. Matthew chapter 16, and if you would with me, and I know we've read it a few times over the past weeks, but we're going to start here and we're going to move all the way through 17, verse 13. So let's um, read the word of our Lord. Matthew 16, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into the high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine like the sun and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, say only Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and shall restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, so also the Son of Man shall suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. May God bless the reading of his word. As we begin this morning, I would tell you that there um, have been a multiple of books that seek to build a case that Christ is who he says he is. There's been books that have started, some people have started, they say, from the position of atheism, from the position of disbelief, and they set out to prove that he's not who he says he is. And doing that, they are proved, or they 
are changed in their thought and in their mind and come to the conclusion that he is who he says he is. There's those, whether you want to be whatever the titles are, a case for Christ, evidence that demands a verdict, you can go through all of them and all of these coming through to try and build the case that Jesus is or is not who he says that he is, to build a legal case and standing before Christ. This type of thing is not new. And this morning I hope to demonstrate to you in Scripture that the case has already been built and it was built by Christ and the Heavenly Father. And it's one that is legal and that will stand up in any legal court, but most especially the legal court which is on high before God the Father himself, the only one that actually matters, not the court of man's opinion. Having said that, it has been 18 years since my buddy beat me in the race and arrived home before I did, and has been almost 40 years, if I look over my life, that the Lord has been instructing and guiding me, not necessarily that he is who he says he is, because there's something, it, to me, I've just always, he, Christ is God. There's no debate. And the best example I've shared with you nu numerous times, uh, it came from one Pastor Crawford. I have no more need to do anything to prove that Christ is Christ than I have a need to prove that my wife is my wife. I understand it and I know it. We are one. And so I need no symbol. I need no nothing else. I know who he is. But there was a great desire that was um, heightened 18 years ago. Not just a sense of having, not, not having to know that he is real, but having to know the realness of who he is. If that makes sense. A little difference in phrasing to describe it better. The reality of the word. And as you all know by now, if you're honest and we go through the testimony, and that's not much what matters right now, but if we go through the testimony, it was began in a sense of wanting to know where my beloved one is, what's going on, what's happening there. I stand in front of you 18 years later saying, I just want to know Jesus. I just want to know Jesus. What a, what an incredible reality for God to be able to show you the greatness of who he is through suffering and the value. You see, I would have a statement for you. I would encourage you as a congregation, if you want to be um, joyous in this life, I would encourage you be heavenly minded enough to know that there's no earthly good comparable to that which lays ahead for the redeemed. I know that's not what you read in Christian bookstores. There's literally books labeled Christian that would warn you don't be so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. And I would say it's a great aim of every believer to be of no earthly good. To be so heavenly minded that you recognize that everything in this world is a non-comparable treasure to heaven. To heaven. Now before I go any further in my introduction, you have to forgive my introduction this morning, but before I go any further, let me draw to you the connection so that you can see it, so that you're not all sitting there wondering where is he going with this this morning, what about the text? The connection is this. The disciples were so fixed on what they thought was a successful earth, earthly strategy that they missed the present that was in front of them and the future that was to come in their understanding. And it, 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 it drove a uncertainty and a fear where we have the opportunity with the Holy Spirit present in us, the Word of God present before us, to look and to observe that whatever they thought of this world, whatever the Roman government, whatever the Pharisees and Sadducees put before them, whatever things looked like before the eyes of man, the Word of Christ was supreme. 
And they needed only to rest in that. And I guess what I'm trying to say is over the 18 years where you think you would have learned it hard and fast 18 years ago, it's been a continual cycle, much like the disciples of learning. That's really true. I told the children this morning, heaven is real. Heaven is true. It's a real place. God is real. God is true. Well, guess what? The word of God is real and is true. And I am convinced 100%, though my flesh rages war against it, that it's true. So I know the modern push of the evangelical church is to not be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. And I know it's a threat to the evangelical machine to have a hopeful eye fixed on above rather than anxious ones here below. But I encourage you, church, to look above and let all things of this earth quickly go. Let it go. I guess that's something to say, and it's something else to try and contemplate the meaning and the application. And I think that's been my biggest struggle as a preacher over these 18 years. How do I convey that? If I go through a story, I started 18 years ago, and I'm standing in front of those who are the very age of my, my brother who just went home to be with the Lord. He just opened his eyes to reality. Right? That's what that is. Eyes open to reality. And I'm standing before his peers, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to convey that. And you got to get the wrestling. His peers are all there turning in, you know, trying to prepare for college and career and all of these things. And I'm standing there as youth pastor saying, nah, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You want the reaction of the church at that time? That man needs some antidepressants. I say, you don't, you don't get it. It's not a depression type thing. This is the joy. The, the joy is you are, you are so fixed on your 40 for 40. Right? This is what we fix our lives on. 40 for 40. Right? 40 hours a week for 40 years. And we train our children in it. The conformity to this world is 40 for 40. 40 hours a week for 40 years. You got to know how to do it. You got to know how to push through it. You got to know how to survive it. You got to know how to conform to it. And I was just stuck on Romans 12. It's got to be true. It's got to be true. And I was stuck in Timothy, that the Word of God is able to equip us for every good work, that the focus doesn't have to be 40 for 40. The focus doesn't have to be, and I'm not saying that we don't get up and go to work, and that's the part where I struggled, and, and so many of you have been so gracious with me as I've struggled through. How do I convey this? How, how, do, I, how, do, I, how do I say it? The Word of God says it, but how do we... How do we shake ourselves awake to it? Because the reality is, if God says His Word is enough for every good work to equip us, and, and the church is to equip the saints for the works of the ministry, and, and that we're not to be conformed to the patterns of this world, and there's a definite pattern of the world, but we're to be transformed, metamorphosized in the renewing of our minds. That is to know the will of God, the, the pattern, the desire of God for our lives. That's got to be true. And that's got to be the treasure worth seeking. Lose this life and find it. Seek it and you'll lose it. Be not conformed to the patterns of the world, but transformed by the patterns of your mind. I'm convinced that we are in the midst of a generation that does not know what such a life would mean. But I'm hopeful that we're also in the midst of a generation that's kind of been shooken enough that it might be waking up to a desire for it. We live in Egypt, and the promised land sounds nice, but we've heard about the wilderness. And as far as I can tell, most prefer just to wait it out in Egypt. We'll wait for the promised land to come to us and we'll continue to be Egypt dependents. Right? It's the same old story. You brought us out here to die. Let's go back. Let's go back. 
I get that sense. I don't know if you do. A heavenly-minded soul recognizes that in the present, you have no greater privilege or experience in life. That is to say that nothing compares to the opportunity that you hold in the Bible that you have in your hands. No greater opportunity than to read that text. There's nothing greater in life. There's no greater pursuit that somebody could aim to pursue than to open up the Word of God and to read it. And I would challenge you that if you would read that on a daily basis and go through it and, and comb through it, I bet you would have more doctrine than most people that stand in the pulpits. More doctrine. Perhaps the most amazing thought of this is that word that we hold in our hands is the word of the sovereign God. It's God's word. We have no other point, we have no other purpose to gather here this morning but to recognize that. You see, if it's not the word of God that we are about to look in and study, if that's not the word of God, there's no point in us being here. There's no point. We should just go home. But I'm convinced that we're not wasting our time. I'm absolutely convinced, convinced that this is the Word of God. And I guess you could say my simple hermeneutic, my interpretive discipline, maybe it's overly simple, but it could be described as this. I take God at His Word. That's it. You can go to seminary and try to learn hermeneutics. You can study all of that, the interpretive disciplines. I believe the most simple, basic, foundational hermeneutic, which again, is just saying your, your interpretive discipline, your, your pattern for how you interpret the Word of God. The interpretive discipline that you can never go without is do you or do you not take God at His Word? If you take God at His Word, all other hermeneutics drive forth from that. Because do you know what all others is based off of? What does he say? What does God say? I don't tend to take just any man at his word. I don't tend to take my feelings as truth. I don't take my sight or perceived circumstances as reality, but I do take Almighty God at his word. I say that because when we come to a revelation of understanding, when we open a portion of Scripture, such as what we're going to go through this morning, and we come to a point of Scripture and we come to this new understanding within it, when we come to a place where we see something as the Word of God and the opportunity to take God at His Word, to recognize that is to recognize that we have a knowledge gained, but we have something more than that. We have an eternal truth recognized. We have a treasure beyond mortality realized. And friends, you can claim all of the earthly diplomas, all of the earthly degrees that you want to claim, but none of that comes even close to gaining one single truth from the Word of God. All of the things that you are made able to gain and acquire in this world will pass away and will flee like a vapor. But the Word of God will stand forever. Imagine having that birth within you. Imagine that. That's what we're doing here this morning. That, that, that is it. And, and that's the part that blows my mind as how... I say my mind, I, it, it must blow the mind of even the saints that have gone before us that we read about th this morning, that the church, knowing these things... The gathering together can be put on such a low priority list. You see, what I'm trying to speak to you is the first truth in the mind of one who is heavenly minded. But with that first truth of, in the mind of one who's heavenly minded, that the word of God is the word of God, that it is true and it is faithful that it is that which we build and are built upon, that we stand upon. The every aspect of our lives 
or, or stood upon that word of the everlasting God, for every time that we come upon that truth, what I found over these 18 years is there's a hesitation that comes with it. There, there's a but. There's a yes and type of thing. What hesitation am I speaking of? Go ahead and identify it, right? Don't be scared of it. If, if you know your symptoms, you got to recognize the problem, and then you can identify the cure. And our, our symptoms, this is leading us right back to the disciples. Who, do, who does everybody say that I am? Jesus asked to Peter. Well, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's right. That's why I am. The healthy mind would say, listen to him. He says, so here's what I must do. I have to go suffer, be crucified, raise again. The ill-fed mind, right? The ill-fed mind, and we know it's an ill-fed mind because Jesus is going to say, get behind me, Satan. The ill-fed mind says, may it never be, Jesus. No, we will defend you, right? The word of God says, it is good and profitable for every good work. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The healthy mind says, yes, let me feed upon it. The ill-fed mind says, but I got to do these things if I'm going to survive. The hesitation, that's been my wrestling. Do you, do you get that? I'm, I'm not saying this. I'm not putting on you guys. I'm explaining my wrestling with the Word of God as a preacher, as a pastor. How do I, how do I preach this? A big thing today in all sermons is application, 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 right? Give me my three steps, what I need to do. How do I make my life better a little bit? And I'm saying, you, lose it. The, the, all I got is the Bible says, lose it. Your life here is eh. Don't seek it. Don't seek it. There's a better life. And you can't seek both of them. You can't seek both of them. Yes, we say the truths of Scripture are beyond anything in this life, but we have in our minds patterns, traditions, or just culturally identified a second branch. It's one that says yes to heaven, but identifies the life as something here and now. So we have a wrestling. I tell you this morning, the most blinding thing the disciples had is they had a wrestling. What about this here and now? There's a Roman government. There's the scribes and their Pharisees. There's something we need now. We can't see what you're, or hear what you're talking about because we know we've been told by the Pharisees who, by the way, want to kill you. We've been told how it's supposed to be worked out by them. So we need this thing to work out in this way. What you're doing, Jesus, you're never going to survive this life. You're never going to make it through. But what did Jesus know? Does anybody know the key of what Jesus knows? Listen, this is going to blow the roof off Romans 12, 1 through 3. Jesus knew the good and perfect will of the Father. What does Romans 12 tell you? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove out what? The good and perfect will of God. That's what everybody's searching for, but everybody's searching the earth. Not the word. Not the word. So last week, we touched on the beginning of chapter 17. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it's this whole section of Scripture in my study has, has real, just blown my mind. And we saw in chapter 17 that Christ was transfigured before his disciples. Now, that was my introduction coming into this. And it was a little long, and I apologize. But coming into this, we're going to move into more of an um, uh, inspector role of looking through it to discover really the words and what's being said. And so last week in 17, we saw that Christ was transfigured before his disciples. And two things here. First, Christ was transfigured. Second, it was before James, Peter, and John. 
Now, let's go back in our investigation and look at the first. What does it mean that Christ was transfigured? The Greek word for transfigured is metamorpho. It's meaning literally a change in form. And this is where we get the word metamorphosis. This is where you get about the caterpillar changing into the butterfly and all of those things. This is not to say that Christ became something that he wasn't. And we have to be very mindful of that. This isn't to say that at this point Christ became God and before he wasn't. That's not what we're saying. That is not the correct interpretation of this. This is to say that he showed forth or shined forth, if you follow the text, as a fullness of who he is. He was metamorphosized into the fullness of his being. He was shown in a new form unto the three disciples. Interesting thing about this, this is the same word that's used for believers in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Again, this is not saying that the redeemed become something that they're not, but that they shine forth as that which they actually are in Christ. The renewing of your mind shines you forth as to who you actually are, where when you are conformed to the patterns of the world, you are living the life of the hypocrite being something that you're not. Okay? So we'll get more into Romans 12 later, but for now concerning our text, the student must ask, number one, what is a new form that previously had not been seen by the disciples? Number two, how is this form different? And number three, why is this important? Or why is it here? In order to answer any of these, we have to go back and review chapter 16. Now, I realize all of this is a little bit of review, but bear with me. My intent is to go deeper and then even a little bit farther in the text. I don't know how to fully explain how big this moment is. Remember the end of chapter 16, verse 28. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You would recall a few things about this passage. Number one, the shall not. It's an absolute negative in the Greek. That means absolutely this shall not happen until. There's no doubt. The other key word is some. And the note here that we made last week is that this some is plural, not singular. Our interpretation is we take God at his word. He said plural. We're going to take him at his word. That is how I am interpreting this text. So the summary is coming into chapter 17, we have more than one disciple who absolutely will not die before seeing the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's the interpretive summary that we enter into chapter 17 with. Now in Matthew chapter 17, we read, after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into the high mountain apart. Now, there's an interesting note or question of study that was made here this past week, and I, I thought on it more throughout the week, and again, it just it captivated me, this thought. And, and the thing that was brought up, it was brought up in the elders' meeting, and that is to make note of this, and I didn't make note of it last week. The time here is six days. I don't know how many of you th thought about that. I know at least one did. It was six days. If you recall from last week, I'm of the persuasion that the fulfillment of Matthew 16, 28 is found in Matthew 17, 1 through 9. The question is, doesn't that seem really close to when Jesus made the statement? Isn't that a really short period? Like he's making this huge statement. I tell you, there are some here who shall not pass away before you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days, boom. Right? If that's my translation, then that's, that's the picture of what's happening. None of the disciples at this point, if you think about it, none of them passed away by this point. So he could have just said, all of you will not pass away, except for what? Not all of them saw it, did they? Isn't the key of chapter 17 that some of them were taken by Jesus? Namely three. 
pay attention to everything that's happening here. It sounds overly simplified. Everything that's in this text is important for the understanding of it. The key to note about the text is that it is not that others must die first, but it's rather only a statement of what will be witnessed by some prior to their own death. The some can witness something before the death of any of the all and apart from the all at the same time. The point here is that we recognize that it is not a requirement that anyone die before some witness what Christ says that the some shall witness. Following? Okay. However, the question remains, why just six days? And I think the question blows this passage wide open in a really exciting way. So I want to offer something to you. And as always, I invite you and urge you and remind you, you are uh, um, responsible and even, I would say, required to do your own study. But I believe that we are given enough in the text before us to responsibly see that Jesus made this statement and then took, and then this took place only six days after the statement in chapter 16 for a very key reason and purpose. As a matter of fact, I believe that the closeness to which this took place is, is essential. I would go so far to say it's essential, that it must be. Why? First, this had to take place before Christ begins his march towards the cross, in my view. Prior to Christ's advancement on, he will here have a legal eyewitness confirmation that he is who he says he is. Do you remember Deuteronomy chapter 19:15? Of course you do, right? <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15 says that any legal case must be made by what? How many witnesses? Two or three witnesses. How many disciples went with Christ? Three. Boom! <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I'll continue to unpack it. So what's the significance of the eyewitness account being made before the cross? What is a witness of the eyewitnesses? That, those are my second observations. That's what I'm trying to unpack in my study going through the week. So that was the first. Second, there's a legal eyewitness confirmation here prior to Christ going to the cross that Christ is the very God, the second person in the Trinity. Do you realize how many cults that blows out of the water? How many cults that just completely disproves a proper translation of Matthew 16 through 17 completely disproves? By the way, an improper translation would still leave it open. He has to build the legal case that the father is well pleased in the son. In other words, before taking the, the offering to the altar, the sacrifice to the altar, it has to be shown forth that this is the acceptable sacrifice. Now, I know that you've all heard that he died on the cross and he rose again, proving that he was an acceptable sacrifice. But what I'm telling you is it was proven before the sacrifice was offered. It had to go before God as an acceptable sacrifice. You know what happens when people make strange sacrifices before God. It doesn't go over well. It has to be shown that he is full, true, and the sacrifice. Number three, it has to be shown forth that what Christ speaks has authority as from the Father. In other words, the case is legally established here that Christ the Lord is the acceptable sacrifice. Again, I don't know if we can grasp the spans of this, the enormity of this on eternity and how crucial of a moment this is in the text of Scripture. And I'm with you in saying, I don't know that I've ever read through Matthew 16 and 17 and really pulled it out as I ought. This, my friends, is a second Adam saying what he must do. And this is the Father God Almighty saying he is pleased in him and commanding that the disciples listen to him. Do you remember how all this began? Christ asked Peter, who do you say that I am? 
Peter's resp response was that our Lord Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And Christ told Peter this was revealed to him by who? By the Father. Now ask this, because this is the second part that really just pulled me in this week. Where is the Father? He's in heaven. This was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. Now highlight that word and location identification, friends. It's going to be crucial. The Father is in heaven. Now perhaps the next biggest question that comes up in relation to 17 being the fulfillment of 1628 is how can it be the fulfillment of Christ's kingdom if Christ's kingdom didn't come? Right? And to that, I would say, I very much so agree. As a matter of fact, I would say my whole point is built on the fact that his kingdom didn't come. And that's why I disagree so much with the other interpretations that try to say it was this, the fulfillment took place in 70 AD. Because I don't believe his kingdom has yet come. Now, I'm not saying that his kingdom has yet to come into existence. I'm saying kingdom yet to come unto earth okay to be established here the thousand year reign of the king ruling and reigning on his throne visibly upon earth yet to take place neither do I believe that the text says that the disciples would see the kingdom coming in that manner However, I do believe that they saw Christ coming in his kingdom. Okay? The text says that some of the disciples will not pass away until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Who's coming, the Son of Man or the kingdom? The Son of Man in his kingdom. Okay, so it's going to be proper looking at the sentences again. My hermeneutic is the word of God matters. Take the word at the word. And that's what my whole study is. I, I'm, I promise you, I'm not trying to be smart here. I'm trying to be precise with the word. My great desire is to know what the word says. I, I come at you in my origination of, of this study with no, no case and point to try to prove one point of of dispensationalism or non-dispensational covenant or non-covenant or anything like that. I, I come at you as a free studier, right? As looking at it and just wanting to know what the Word of God says. You see, I think that's one of the greatest benefits of 18 years ago. 18 years ago, it was convinced in, in my heart and mind, I could care less what people wanted to label something. I only cared if it was true. That's it. I just want to know if it's true. Now, I'm not saying I hold a corner in truth, but I'm convinced that the Word of God is truth. So, bear with me for a moment. I'll try to explain what I'm saying. I'm trying to highlight and to take note of the words used. Now, having said that, the text says, They shall see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. The crucial word that I'm highlighting here is in. In is to speak of a fixed position. It is to be spoken of as properly in or within, a realm or a sphere, the condition or state of which something operates from. That is what he is saying. The key here is that this is speaking positionally. What is going to be seen is a fixed position or the positional witnessing of Christ's coming. And what is this fixed position? It is his kingly position. The disciples saw, or what the disciples saw, was Christ in his kingdom. They saw Christ, these some, and I would argue the only ones who ever did in the first coming. They saw Christ in his first coming, that is the first advent, in his kingdom. They saw that this is the launching point of the establishing of his kingdom come. Let me try to say it this way. We speak of the life of Christ as his first advent, which means his first coming. His first coming. You all agree with me on that point, right? 
in his first coming, no man saw him in his kingdom. No man saw him in his king, kingly glory. No man saw him in his position of majesty. That is to say, no man except three. Except three. I'm suggesting the three witnesses gave a legal standing, saw Christ our Lord coming in the form by the blessing of the kingdom with kingly authority. That is why the last phrase or the phrase of the father from the cloud said, listen to him because he is speaking with kingdom authority. Now, furthermore, we can confirm from our text that they saw him in his first coming in his glorified heavenly kingdom. How can we confirm that? Because who was there at the Mount of Transfiguration? Who said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased? Listen to him. Who said that? God the Father. Where is God the Father? Peter, this was revealed to you from where? Heaven. Heaven. From my Father who is in heaven. Now Peter's with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, and who's there? The Father. Guess where they are? Heaven. They are in the midst of the kingdom of heaven. That's what they're, Why do you think Moses and Elijah are there? Why do you think that's taking place? Now get this. They see the Son of Man. This is the term of the humanity of Christ. If we go back to 16, they see the Son of Man. Specifically what is said in the text is that they are going to see Christ and His humanity coming in His kingdom. The Son of Man coming in His kingdom. This, to me, becomes not even a stretch or an educated guess. This becomes exactly what the text says it happens in the transfiguration. As a matter of fact, I don't see any other time in history that this could have even happened. Why is this so important? Again, as I said last week, this turns so much on its head. When theologians and pastors take this to 70 AD or any of the other interpretations, then this is used to, used to say that we are in his kingdom now or that we are the establishers, we are the builders of his kingdom, that we are now in the kingdom, earthly kingdom reign now. Boy, wouldn't that be disappointing, <laughs> right? I, I don't see anybody calling a hundred years old a child. Uh, I, there's so many things missing from that. And I'm simply telling you, I believe that we have solid biblical proof that we are not presently in his kingdom yet, yet. And we're not in it while we are here on earth. We are of him. We are ambassadors. We are of that kingdom. That is our identity. But the kingdom has not yet come in the form of the second advent. I don't say this to get into theological arguments. I'm just trying to say what I believe the text clearly says. So let me take it a step further. Christ is transfigured. He's met metamorphosized here so that the disciples could see him as he is in his fixed position, in his kingly state. And we read Romans 12, 2, and we read that we are to renew our minds and listen, right? For if we go back to Matthew, the disciples are told, listen to what he says. That's the renewing of our minds is to listen to the word of God and what it says so that we will not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but that we will be transformed. Same word, metamorphosized. That is to say that just as the disciples saw him as he actually was before the eyes of the father, and also saw and heard the work of Christ and what must be done as coming forth from the word of Christ. So we are made able to see who we are in Christ rather than being blinded by the patterns of the world. The gift of grace that is brought down through the church by the spirit of God and the word of God is to see your true identity in Christ and see your true Ah, calling in life, your ambassadorship.
It should have a great effect on us as we read it. It had a great effect on the disciples. When the disciples heard this, the cloud coming forth saying, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased, they fell on their face. They were sore afraid. That is to say, they reverenced him. The disciples here recognized his superiority to themselves. They recognized the king. Interesting part here is at this point, in this moment, when it says that they fell down on their face and were afraid, one of those was Peter. Peter had no statement. At that point, he finally got it. He reverenced him. Jesus came and he touched them and he said, Arise and be not afraid. And then when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. And they came down from the mountain and Jesus charged them saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Verse 10, And his disciples asked him saying, When then say the scribes that Elijah might come first? Pay attention here because they're starting to get into the same interpretation that many still do today. This is it. This is it. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. One thing from this verse I want you to affirm. Remember how we began the sermon, my hermeneutic? Take God at his word. That means we're not going to be able to pick which one we want whether it's verse 11 or verse 12, okay? We have to take God at his word, every word. Jesus said unto them, Elijah truly shall come, first come, and restore all things. So the thing from this verse that I want you to affirm to yourself before we read verse 12. Jesus here clearly states that Elijah shall come First, that is before the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's what the disciples were asking about. Isn't this the great and terrible day of the Lord? Isn't this where you're going to overthrow everything and restore everything? And then why does it say that he must come first? And Jesus says he certainly must come first. And the flip of that is to say Elijah has not yet come. In our interpretive breakdown, our hermeneutic stepping into verse 12, you have to have in your notes affirmed, Elijah has not yet come. Got it? Elijah has not yet come. Verse 12, but I say unto you that Elijah has come already. Elijah has not come. Take God at his word. Elijah has not come. But I say to you, Elijah has come already. A pause, because I think that might be, and I'm, I'm reading in the white spaces a little bit here, but I think that might be what the disciples are doing in their head. What? Right? Wait a minute. Elijah did come, but he didn't come because all of these, and then who was it that we saw on the mount? But then Jesus continues, and he says, they knew him not. Now pause again, because the disciples are trying to take all of this in. We're trying to take all of this in. I can picture them saying, wait a minute, we knew him not. We just saw Elijah on the mount. We knew who that was. Who did we not know? Who is Jesus speaking of? And then Jesus says, but have done to him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Now, I believe what is being said here is as evidenced in how they treated John the Baptist who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. The restoration is not yet. I believe that's the heart of what's being said here. The restoration is not yet. It cannot be because redemption must first come. The disciples are wondering why they can tell no one about Christ, right? Because they're thinking this is the great and terrible day of the Lord. They're thinking it so much that this must be the great and terrible day of the Lord that they're wondering, why is Elijah not with us and coming? 
Why is he not setting the stage here? Because this has been put into their mind since they were little children from, from the teachings that they know the scripture. It's not that they're ignorant of the scripture. They know the scripture and they know that before the great and terrible day, Elijah might, must come. And so they're telling Jesus, they have their hermeneutic. They're saying the word says Elijah will come first. And Jesus says, yes, before the great and terrible day, Elijah must come first. But what don't they get? This is not that day. This is not that day. Why is it not that day? Because I tell you, Elijah has already come. And if this was that day, what is evidenced in the one who came in the spirit and power of Elijah is that if the day of judgment is today, no one makes it. No one makes it. What time are we in here in the text? We are in the time of sacrifice, the day of grace. What time are we not in? We are not in the day of the Lord. Why? Because observe how the people treated John the Baptist and thusly how they shall treat the Lord, the Christ. Redemption is a must prior to to judgment. Redemption must take place prior to judgment. Now we have recognized two things from this text that will be vital in our future outlook of things. Elijah has not, not, has not yet come. That's number one. Number two, the kingdom has not yet been. The earthly coming of it. Now here's an interesting thought to me. Jesus points out their treatment of John the Baptist. And I know the scribes and Pharisees were not big fans, right? They're not big fans of him. But who killed John the Baptist? What was Herod? He was king. Was he Jewish? What? Roman, right? He was Roman. This is another interesting observation. Now, he was foolish in it. Right? It was a rather foolish thing to do, a foolish guarantee to make in the things that were taking place. And then when you get to Jesus, who's crying out, crucify him? The Jews. So here you have represented in this text, in this reference, that both Jew and Gentile, neither were prepared for the day of the Lord. Neither one. Neither Jew nor Gentile. Redemption was necessary for both. For both. I see it as an undeniable picture that no man, neither Jew or Gentile, is ready for the restoration of all things because redemption has to come first. So let's close with this conclusion. The great redemptive work of Christ, observe these things. Number one, Christ is the Son of the living God. Number two, he must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and rise again on the third day. Number three, there must be eyewitnesses as to who he is unto his commissioning and his going forth as the acceptable sacrifice, the worthiness of his sacrifice, and that is made in the Mount of Transfiguration. And number four, he is doing this in fulfillment of our need. We have need for this work to be done. We have need for this. God knows our need. I began this message by telling you this world, its wisdom and everything else has nothing to offer. Nothing to offer but to trust in the Word of God. That I am comfortable enough with that truth to direct my children in it. To direct my children, if you learn nothing else but how to read the text of Scripture and pray to Almighty God, you will have more education that will take you farther than the person with a thousand degrees and diplomas and probably a stronger one. Why? Because you would have been forced to spend your life studying truth. Studying truth. 
I told you that it is, it is, it is worthy of our, the fullness of our trust without any hesitation, recognizing that the flesh gives daily hesitation. It is worthy, I would even say, of our wrestling, <laughs> of our saying, how can this work out? How can this be? And what I'm trying to say from this text is you have the greatest example of why this is so. My greatest argument for this is found in the example of Christ. How can this be, Jesus, that for right now to be the day of the Lord is not the best case scenario? How can it be that for you to, to not overthrow the Roman government and not let the Pharisees and the scribes trick you into that which they want to do, which is crucify and kill you, how can it be to not rage war against that and be victorious? How can that be that that's best for you and, and you know, us, <laughs> right? How can it be that's best for us, your followers, who people know our faces, they know our names, and they're going to witness you now being taken to the cross how is that going to help us to survive here? And the wisdom of God is, it's a must. For you will not make it through the great and terrible day, lest redemption comes first. And if he could be trusted to that degree, do you get the darkness of that hour? You know, the fear of us, whether or not we're going to, whatever it is, have enough money, is something going to happen to take away all of our earthly securities? You realize that's what the disciples had happen on that day and beyond. They staked their lives on this is the redeeming king. And they witnessed him scourged beyond recognition. Despising the shame hung on the cross. And they ran and hid. They hid. And their fear didn't change the Word of God. That's the truth I'm trying to drive home. Your fear, your doubt, is not changing the Word of God. So my application question is, if that's true, what is your fear and doubt causing you to miss out on? Peace? Joy? Rest? It's amazing that you can find such words in the midst of suffering. Our God is good, amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, every word of your word is truth. Forgive the limitations of your preacher. And may your spirit and your word work to encourage these, your children. May your truth shine forth in them. May we recognize the truth which was read in Hebrews 11. That unless we are set apart, unless we are sanctified, and we can only be set apart by the work of Christ. Unless that happens... We will not know redemption. Thank you for your work of redemption. Thank you for your work of sanctification. Thank you for the hope that is in the joy set before us. The life that is eternal. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus our Lord. Thank you, God that we are yours. That the intimacy that we will know is the intimacy with Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. May that be the longing of our lives. We thank you. We pray all this by means of Jesus our Lord. Amen.